Say hi, Cece. Say hi, Bells. Hi, Bell. No, you gotta say hi. Hi. When Chris and I got married, we moved out here after visiting, fell in love with the area. It's gorgeous in Colorado. I'm making some Italian cookies today, but this guy right here, he's gonna do all the dishes. That's me. Communications, this is Stacey. Hi, Stacey. My name's Nicole, and I'm calling because I'm concerned about um, a friend of mine. Um, I dropped her off at her house at 2 in the morning last night because we were out of town together, and we were on the way back from the airport, and she's pregnant. And I haven't been able to get a hold of her this morning. She won't answer the door. She won't answer phone calls. She won't answer text messages. What's her name? Shanann Watt. Alrighty, we do have a call in, Nicole. We'll have an officer come out that way as soon as we can. Welcome back to Crime A to Z, where we detail cases and criminals from their very beginning until well after other reporting ends. Since you're a human on this planet, you've very likely already heard about the Chris Watts case. It's arguably one of the most covered and followed murder cases of our time. So we decided it's about time to give the Crime A to Z treatment to the case that has made so many people question how well they really know someone. After learning the full details of the case, we have a brand new level of disrespect for Chris Watts. So sit back, because while this case may start off with information you already knew, it almost certainly will not end that way. And before we start, if you like this video or any of our videos, we always, always genuinely appreciate you hitting like and subscribe and hopefully share. A really quick editor's note. Given the staggering volume of information related to this case, it's important to mention that, as usual, this video is based on either official court or police documents referenced statements, and other verified or reputable sources, weeding out the speculations, theories, and unverified information. Let's go. Shannon Catherine Ruzek was born on January 10, 1984, to parents Frank and Sandra Ruzek. Pronounced Shannon by friends and Shannon by her family, she grew up with her younger brother, Frank Jr., or Frankie, in Aberdeen, North Carolina. The family was small and close. According to Shannon's friends and family, she was a go-getter from the start. When she put her mind to something, she did whatever she needed to do to accomplish it. She was a boss in every good sense of the word. When Shannon was around 18, she married for about six years before it ended in divorce. Shannon herself would later recall how, although the relationship was painful, she grew from it. And, eventually, became stronger for it. And that's who Shannon was. Learning from her experiences, growing, and finding happiness. It was during one of her particularly challenging life experiences in August of 2010. Having just been in a car accident and facing the painful recovery process, as well as just being diagnosed with lupus, that she met Chris Watts. In 2010, Shannon had a Facebook account but was not a regular poster. It was on that platform that she received a friend request from a man she didn't know. He was a cousin of a friend of hers. She figured. And I got a friend, friend request from Chris on Facebook, and I was like, oh, what the heck, I'm never going to meet him. Except. Christopher Lee Watts was born on May 16, 1985 in Spring Lake, North Carolina, to parents Ronnie and Cindy Watts. The couple also had a daughter, Chris's older sister, Jamie. As a child, Chris loved playing sports, including basketball, baseball, and football. He also loved NASCAR racing, which he'd attend with his dad. Chris was always described as quiet and easygoing, someone who got along with everyone. In his Pine Forest High School yearbook, he's described as being into automotive repairs, and he appeared on the patriotic page. After graduating Pine Forest, Chris attended NASCAR Tech, a trade school specializing in motorsport technology careers. As is often the case when it comes to attraction, Chris's personality was the opposite of Shannon's. While Shannon was outgoing and gregarious, Chris was the opposite, shying away from attention. He didn't date throughout high school, with Shannon being his first serious relationship longer than six months. After Shannon met Chris on Facebook, she fell in love with the platform. It became her means to connect with family and friends, both old and new. She became a prolific poster, chronicling her battles, her triumphs, her everyday highs and lows so that her friends, family, and followers could intimately keep up with all that was Shannon. 
Shannon and Chris's relationship flourished. After almost two years of dating, the couple decided to move to Colorado. So, in 2012, Chris arrived ahead of Shannon, living in the basement of a family that Shannon had briefly been the nanny for back in North Carolina. Shannon joined him in a couple months, and they continued staying there until their home in Colorado was finished being built. The couple married on November 3, 2012, back in North Carolina. They moved into their five-bedroom home in Frederick, Colorado, and began planning and living out their seemingly picture-perfect lives together. Chris had already gotten a job at the local Ford dealership as a mechanic, and Shannon got a job there as a salesperson as well. And it didn't take long for them to start growing their family. By February in the following year, 2013, Shannon was pregnant with her first child. Bella Marie Watts was born in December of 2013. And less than two years later, in July 2015, they welcomed his second daughter, Celeste Catherine Watts, who they lovingly called Cece. 2015 was a busy year for the couple. Aside from Cece being born, Chris landed a new job as a field coordinator at Anadarko, a local oil and natural gas drilling company. And Shannon was working in a call center at a children's hospital. The couple was bringing in about $90,000 per year, but it wasn't enough. They had accumulated a significant amount of debt. With over $70,000 in credit card debt, student loans, and medical bills, particularly a $25,000 out-of-pocket expense for neck surgery that Shannon had to have, and two years of regular doctor visits trying to get the girls properly diagnosed. They decided they couldn't meet their monthly expenses. They filed for bankruptcy that year. But things would start to look up. At the beginning of 2016, Shannon joined Lavelle, a multi-level marketing company selling vitamin-infused patches, she was a natural, being the caring, giving go-getter that all her friends knew her to be, someone who people instantly wanted to be friends with. She grew to becoming a top producer, earning vacations, allowances, and according to Chris and a friend of hers, a handsome income. She once posted about how the company pays her a monthly automobile bonus. Both on Facebook and in real life, Shannon's friends and family could see that she was happy. And by all accounts, those same friends and family, without exception, knew Chris to be a kind, quiet, and loving husband, and a dedicated, doting father. Both parents adored their children, and were raising them to be confident and caring. Well, one thing led to another, and eight years later, we have two kids, we live in Colorado, and he's the best thing that has ever happened to me. Shortly after posting that video in 2018, Shannon learned that she was pregnant again. She posted how she shared the moment with Chris on Facebook. We did it again. <laughs> I like that shirt. Really? Really. That's awesome. So pink means... That's just the test. I know. It's just that the pink is going to be girls? I don't know. Just the test. That's awesome. Chris appeared happy. A gender reveal party was planned, but it would never happen. Shannon had been away for the weekend on a work-related trip while Chris was home with the two girls for the weekend. At about 1.48 a.m. after a flight delay, an exhausted Shannon is finally dropped off at home by her friend, Nicole Atkinson, who was also on the trip with her. Later that morning, friends have grown worried that they've not heard from Shannon and that she wasn't returning their calls or texts. Then, once they learned that she was a no-show for an OB appointment, something she would never miss, they're beyond concerned. Nicole Atkinson, the friend who dropped Shannon off in the wee hours of that morning drives to Shannon's house with her 16-year-old and 2-year-old sons. She becomes even more concerned when there's no answer and she can see the shoes Shannon wears every day just inside the front door. And her car is still in a garage, visible through the windows at the top. She calls police requesting a well check. They arrive within minutes. Hi. Here, Nicole? Yes. Okay. So what's going on? So, my friend, um, we were out of town for a business trip this weekend. All right. And I dropped her off at 2 o'clock this morning. She's 15 weeks pregnant. And she wasn't feeling well. And she had a doctor's appointment this morning at 9. And I told her to let me know if she needed me to take her. She's got two little girls. 
and um, she was very distraught over the weekend, wasn't eating normally or drinking, and we kept trying to force it on her because she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, her husband and her supposedly are separating, but she didn't know this. She thought they were just having issues. He disclosed that to me today. Because okay. I called him, and I was like, have you talked or heard from Shanann since you left for work this morning? Because I can't get a hold of her. I called, I texted. Her car's in the garage. Her shoes she wears every single day right in the front door. She only has one vehicle? No, they only have the one vehicle and his work truck. Okay, that's and what I'm asking. There's not a... girl and went on a play date, but they're four and two. She went on a play date? Why wouldn't she take a car? They're both in car seats. Okay. Okay. Um, and then she called me about the car and said that it was in the garage. And I told her that the officer gets Chris on the phone and asks him if he knows where his wife and kids are. He says he doesn't, but that he'll be home in about five minutes. After a few minutes, Chris arrives home. Scott, how are you doing? How's it going? So this is the only vehicle she would have? Only one that, yeah. She would drive? Okay. He immediately goes into the garage and begins searching Shannon's car. Then, he goes into the house through the inner garage door and closes it. He's in the house alone for just over a minute before opening the front door for police and Nicole. Then, Nicole discovers Shannon's cell phone. Does she work? Yeah, she works from home. Oh, from home? She works this is her lifeline. The stark difference between the level of concern shown by Nicole versus by Chris is clear. Do you guys have any kind of issues, marital issues, or? We're going through separation. You are? Do you guys file it yet or anything, or are you just talking about? No, we're going to sell the house and we're going to do a separation. Now, how's that going? Uh, it's, it's going civil for the most civil. part, or? <laughs> she tell you anything about leaving, moving out? Not moving out. I mean, the last time I talked to her was this morning. She said she's going to take the kids to a friend's house, and she asked where she was going to be. And then I've texted her today and never heard anything. But the car's, the car's here. The car's right. here. Unless somebody came and picked her up. But the people that I know, nobody's heard from her, nobody's seen her. Right. Police notice that there is no bedding on the bed. It has been stripped off and bundled on the floor. They find pillowcases and the top sheet in the kitchen trash, but the fitted sheet is missing. Other than that, they don't see any signs of foul play. Chris explains that Shannon usually likes to wash the sheets after she's slept in them after traveling to get the airport off of them. One thing that's clear to everyone searching is that the house is locked up tight from the inside, so there would be no way for an intruder to escape the home leaving everything locked from the inside unless they left through the garage. Police learn that the next door neighbor has a surveillance camera and they head over to see what he may have captured. About this time, Detective Dave Baumover, the sole detective of the Frederick Police Department, is called in to join the search. They hit the jackpot. The camera is pointed directly in the direction of the Watts home. The footage shows that the only person to come or go from the Watts home, at least from the front, is Chris himself. While Chris begins to over-explain himself. I'm loading my stuff up in my cooler. My water jugs, my book bag, my computers, some of the tools that I have in my toolbox. I knew I was going to have to do some pumping, pumping in the rubbers today. So I was out so far. The neighbor explains how the camera will pick up any movement in the vicinity. While an increasingly anxious Chris continues rambling about questions he has not been asked. My detective just showed up, um, so he'll probably want to talk to you. He'd probably. Like I said, you might have you call at the bank and see if there's any kind of activity. Because um, if there is any sort of action out there, his cameras, I would have got it. Like right. we, had, I, we had issues the other other week when people were kind of stealing stuff out of like garages and stuff like that. And I had a park right here. I had here. park right here. Yeah. So yeah. someone, see if I could see where someone tried to jimmy with a flathead screwdriver over there. And it would just like... But if any action would have happened, any cars or anything left yeah. your house, I would have yeah, like right in that area. It should have picked, I mean, like, oh, it'll pick up anything coming down the street this way. You know that trigger Oh, yeah. Okay. Chris's level of stress at this point is visible and obvious. What else can I do with it? Being stressed about his family having disappeared is not an abnormal reaction. But he didn't show that level of stress prior to viewing the video. Viewing that for an innocent person should not add additional stress. After they finish watching the video, Chris hightails it out of there. The officer stays behind. 
All right. I appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Hopefully something comes up. Here's yeah. that. Matter of fact, you just want to go talk to him. I'm going to get his info real quick. And he's right. Chris was strict about never driving his truck onto the driveway out of fear of getting oil from the tires onto the driveway. You can ask them. He's normally quiet. We'll subdue. He's over here telling them, telling you three times what he took out, what he did, what he did, what he did. He's very. He never talks. So the fact that he's over here blabbing his mouth makes me kind of suspicious. Thirty-four-year-old Shannon, four-year-old Bella, and three-year-old Cece are officially considered missing. Watts' official storyline is that Shannon arrived home just before 2 a.m. from her business trip. He claims they had an emotional conversation before he left for work at about 5.15 a.m. No one hears from Shannon for about seven hours until her neighbor arrives at her home at about noon, finding no one there. Once Chris arrives, they find Shannon's phone her purse, her wallet, money, and ID, and even the children's critical medication, which she never left home without. Her car was in the garage and still contained the girls' car seats. The next day, the FBI and the CBI join the investigation. While police are searching his home with police dogs, Chris has agreed to be interviewed by two news stations. When I got home yesterday, it was like a ghost town. Like, she wasn't here. Kids weren't here. I have no idea like where they went. If she wasn't here, like where did she go? Like once I got here, it was like, all right, who can I call? If she's vanished, like I want her back so bad. I want those kids back so bad. Last night, I wanted, I, I wanted that knock on the door. I wanted to see that. I wanted to see those kids just run in, run in, just, just barrel rush me and just give me a hug and knock me on the ground. I'm hoping that somebody sees something or somebody knows something and comes forward. And right now, it's. You got K-9 units, the sheriff's department. Everybody's like they're they're doing their best right now to figure out like if they can get a scent. I called her three times, texted her about three times just to say, you know, right now I don't even want to just like throw anything out there. Like I hope that she's somewhere safe right now and with the kids. That's why last night was just horrible. I couldn't do it. it I just Shannon, Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just come back like if somebody has her just please bring her back I need to see everybody I need to see everybody again this house is not complete with without anybody here please bring her back from the start Chris's lack of emotions was on display for everyone to see and speculate psychologists noted that he even appeared to be smiling or even laughing at times investigators called Chris Watts to the police department that evening for questioning FBI Special Agent Graham Coder conducts the first interview with Watts that evening. Agent's suspicions of Watts were already heightened by his near-emotionless behavior during the television interviews he granted. Then, as the questioning with investigators progressed, there were red flags. For starters, he kept referring to his wife and daughters in the past tense, like when he was shown a picture of his daughters. No matter if it was 100 degrees outside or what, she left those shoes. She always loves those shoes. And Bella, she always wore some flip-flops. She always will. She's just like, she was a girly girl. But for the most part, during the three plus hour interview, Watts sticks to this story that he and Shannon had planned to separate, that she said she was going to stay with a friend and that he had no idea where his wife and kids were. He does admit that things are beginning to look worrisome. What do you think happened? 
At first, I really thought maybe she was just at somebody's house, just yeah. decompressing. She's blowing off steam. Yeah. But after today, like with the onslaught of all the cars, I mean, all the police cars, all the news, all the canine units, it's making me lean the other direction about someone took her. Okay. But it's just, if someone took her, it would have to have been someone she knew. Because there's there's no sign of anything like being disturbed, broken. Mm-hmm. But like that's the way I'm leaning now. At first, I thought she, for real she was just decompressing somewhere. Just, I mean, I thought she was safe, mm-hmm. even though everything in the house was left there. But now it's just after the day with the news crews and everything, it's just it feels more the other direction, and it's freaking me out. At one point, Agent Coder shares with Watts his perspective of how everything is looking. So when I work investigations like this, I have to keep an open mind on everything. And part of keeping an open mind is listening to you talk about your wife and your marriage. And the day she goes missing is the day that you guys have marital discord. Okay. So you can understand what I'm thinking about you. Yeah. What do you think about that? makes me sick to my stomach, honestly. Like, I know, like, I've talked to a few of my friends, it's like, you know, this does not look good on you. I'm like, I know. It's like, people that, if people knew that we were having marital issues, they're gonna look at me, especially with the way everything looks. And it honestly just makes me sick to my stomach because this is something that I would never do. Ever. I, I know, like, you have to look at every every vantage point. This is something I would never do to my kids or my wife at all. But at this point, even though the agent doesn't call it out, his wife and kids are supposedly merely missing. And given his claim that she said she was going to a friend's house, being sick to his stomach because he would never do this to his wife and kids when nothing has been revealed to have been done is telling. The highly skilled agent uses well-proven tactics to coax Watts into divulging what happened, including positive reinforcement to befriend him. But they're not letting him get away with anything either. Uh, 1 p.m. I'm now on my way home to check on my family. Uh, is that just because you're worried with, based on the conversation yeah. from Nicole? Had the police contact you by then? No. Okay. Two, but, I arrive. Sorry, go ahead. But uh, Nicole says she was probably going to call the cops. Okay. All right. Now, so it sounds like Nicole's pretty worried. Mm-hmm. More worried than you. Well, so I, I, once, once she couldn't get anything out of her and nothing was going on at the house, I was like, all right, I gotta go home. But it sounds like Nicole was more worried. Yeah, because like most of like if she doesn't text me, like I understand that. Okay. Like, sometimes that happens. Okay. But for her not to get back to her okay. gr- direct sales group, okay. that was very unorthodox. Okay. Agent Coder asks Watts about any infidelity. So I need to ask you about um, your marriage and uh, infidelity. Okay. Okay. Tell me about it. I have never cheated on my wife. Okay. And I fully suspect she has never done that to me. Oh, okay. Like she's always been a trustworthy person. I've always been a trustworthy person. I fully expect if we ever thought about straying another way Mm -hmm. that we would tell each other before it happened. I think that sounds ridiculous, but he wasn't telling the truth. What Watts doesn't know is that detectives are already aware that he's having an affair. Early that morning, they've been alerted by the head of security at Watts' job that the company had discovered email evidence of a possible affair between Watts and a co-worker. Shortly after that, the co-worker herself, Nicole Kessinger, also came forward to police, claiming that she wanted to divulge their relationship to them and share what she knew about Watts. So, while Watts was being interviewed, police were also interviewing Nicole who we'll refer to as Kessinger to differentiate her from Shannon's friend, Nicole Atkinson. During this first of several police interviews which took place in a park, Kessinger downplayed her relationship with Chris, stating that it wasn't that serious and that Watts was more into her than she was into him. She claimed Watts told her that he was separated and at the end of divorce proceedings. According to Kessinger, after the disappearance, she learned that Shannon was pregnant and that Watts had lied about it. She said that if he could lie about that, she wondered what else could he lie about and worried for the missing family's safety. More on Kessinger in a bit. Meanwhile, back at Chris's interview, he hasn't wavered, 
Since he insists he's telling the truth, police ask him if he will undergo a polygraph test. He agrees. So at 11 p.m., after nearly four hours of questioning and no probable cause to hold him, they plan to part ways for the night and have Chris return in the morning for the polygraph. I want you to go home and I want you to know that I'm the guy you can talk to, okay? Who's not gonna judge you. I have kids. Sometimes I, sometimes I joke with my wife, I just need two weeks alone, you know? Like when you told me about your four to five weeks alone, I was like, wow, that sounds like a slice of heaven, right? Sometimes it's a bit much, okay? I wanna talk to you again tomorrow, okay? okay? I want you to get a good night's sleep and a good breakfast and a good workout, whatever you gotta do, whatever your morning routine is. Chris's father has flown into Colorado to support his son. Chris picks him up from the airport the next morning and the two of them head for the police station and Chris's polygraph. Before the test begins, CBI agent Tammy Lee, who will be administering the test, explains what he can expect. There's actually only two ways you can fail a polygraph, okay? Um, the first way would be if you fail to follow my instructions. I'm going to give you a lot of instructions today about how to sit still, how to answer questions, things like that. So if you fail to follow those instructions, you will not pass today's test, okay? Right. The second way would be if you choose to lie to me today. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is about 100% truth. Um, even if there's, you know, something that you didn't tell the investigators, you know, since Monday, I guess, is when you and the, the police were involved. If there's something that you didn't tell them since Monday, like, that is totally fine. Like, I get it. You know, people aren't going to remember every single detail every time they mm -hmm. talk to someone. As long as you tell me what the truth is today, you will have no problem with passing, okay? Mm -hmm. I promise you that. And obviously, I mean, I hope that, you know, if you did have something to do with their disappearance, um, it would be really stupid for you to come in and take a polygraph today. Exactly. Right? Like, it would be really dumb. Like, mm -hmm. you should not be here right now sitting in this chair if you had anything to do with mm -hmm. Shanann and the little girl's disappearance. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. During the baseline testing, Agent Lee asks Chris to deliberately tell a lie, so they can see what a lie looks like for him on the detector. They find that his lies are obvious. So, you obviously are a really bad liar. Have, have people told you that before? Like, the second you tell a lie, like, they can tell, like, on your face that... Because the second you lie to the number three, like, I don't know if you heard me clicking, but I had to, like, turn down the sensitivity because you're starting to go off the page. So, that is what I need to see as a polygrapher because that tells me that you know it's wrong to tell a lie. Um, and you're actually having a significant reaction when you lie. So, that is awesome. So, thank you for being a proper okay. liar. No, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We don't want to be good liars. So, thank you for being a horrible liar. Then, the real questions come. The test is about to begin. Please remain still. Do you know where Shanann is now? No. Chris failed the polygraph test. And he didn't just fail. Investigators said he scored shockingly low. Police confront Chris about the results and tell him that he needs to come clean. So, um, it is completely clear that you were not honest during the testing, and I think you already know that. Um, he did not pass the polygraph test. Okay. Right? Okay. So now we need to talk about what actually happened. And I feel like you're probably ready to do that. Uh, I didn't. I didn't lie to you on that polygraph. I promise. Chris, I, I'm. I'm. I'm no. gonna stop. It's time. I <laughs> just stop for a minute. Take a deep breath. I, I want you to take a deep breath right now. We're not, we're not here to play games. We're not here to do any of that with you. We just want to know what happened. So can you start from the beginning and tell us what happened? Everything that I've, to, I've told you, I did, I did not lie on this polygraph. I am, I don't know how much I could, I could tell you right now. Like, I did not. It's, it's, not I even, it's not even an option right now because you did not pass the polygraph. I so I know you were being deceptive. So that's not even an issue, an issue right now. The issue right now is what happened to Shanann, Bella, and Celeste. That's the issue right now. Okay. This is where this is where the rubber meets the road, Chris. Like, don't let this continue any longer, please. I'm not trying to make anything continue. Like, I want them back home, like. But you know they're not coming back home. Agent Lee calls him out for not having shed a single tear. I just, I just find it hard to hear you talk about just having this emotional 
you know, conversation with Shanann, and you're bawling and crying together, and you have not shed one tear in two days that you've been here. No. Not one. And I, help me understand that, because I don't get it. You're, these are your baby girls. And you have not shed one tear over them not being around. Chris, I, 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 I lose my four-year-old in the store for 10 seconds, and I start to go panic. Panic. I have not seen any of that from you at all. Help me understand that. I love those girls. I, I would never do any of this because I haven't shed a tear. You get yeah, no, that's weird. I, Is I, that I, weird? I, I, don't, don't look into that like I don't love my well, kids. Tell me, my explain wife. to me. You're, you're crying with your wife that you're leaving her. Yeah. But you don't cry that your two little baby girls. I'm hoping they're things. still around some, I'm hoping they're still somewhere. After a few more minutes, Agent Coder takes a different approach. But you are here today lying about something else. So we need to talk about that, okay? That's your daughter. I know. And this is very good. Keep I, 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 I'm not proud of it. I, I don't think anything like that could happen. I don't think I'd ever do it, but I did. I know. Keep going. Good. She accused me of it. I denied it. I, I, I she was on her, and I felt horrible for it. Like she was pregnant, and it was. I don't want. I didn't hurt her. I cheated on her. I hurt her emotionally. I cheated on her. You're doing a good job. This is the Chris that I knew would come out today. This is the Chris who tells the truth because you're a truth teller. When Agent Coder says, I know, he is subtly sending a message to Watts that not only does he know about the affair, but he may also know much more. But Watts still holds out, not backing down. So Detective Lee decides to deploy a proven strategy of offering Watts a scapegoat. She does it by vilifying Shannon. Chris, did Shannon do something to them? No, I don't know. I'm serious. I have no clue. Then you wouldn't know because they didn't leave the house. Did Shanann do something to them, and then did you feel like you had to do something to Shanann? No, no. No, they were at the house when I left. They were there. They weren't there. They didn't leave. They vanished. I mean, I want to believe that maybe Shanann did it, and you felt compelled to fix this, so Shanann didn't look bad. That's what I. That's what I want to believe. But I don't know, you're not telling me that, so it makes me think the worst. Like, did you I did not do all anything. three of them? I like, did not do anything else, kids. Not do anything. What did she need to do? Tell us, Chris. The strategies are starting to pay off. He starts to get emotional, but still will not admit anything. How about this? If we brought your dad in here, would you please tell him what happened? With Chris eager to talk to his dad, agents weigh the consideration, fully aware that the risk of him lawyering up may increase once he talks with his dad. They take the risk, hoping that the close bond the two of them share may instead lead to an acknowledgement. Hey Chris, we're gonna let you have uh, however much time you need, okay? Sure. Can you leave us in there? Uh, yeah. Yes. I'm 
Chris has confessed to the very scenario agents offered up to him. And with that confession, he accurately foretells his fate to his father. The agents return. And while they are confident that Chris was only taking advantage of the scapegoat scenario they offered up, the first order of business was to locate the bodies. I don't know what to do. I know. I didn't know what to do. Like, none of this, none of this made sense. Why would she hear my f***ing girls? So, Chris, were they in something? Are they under the ground? Like, where would you find them? <laughs> Please don't think anything about them. Talk about that. Are they all three out there, Chris? Yes. Okay. Are they telling something? Are they under something? In something? I don't know what else to do. I know. So I, know I, just, I know. I didn't know what else to do. I was, I was so scared. I know. It's like, oh, I just did this, that, I just did that. What do I do? Right. Or anything that I would do from there was just going to be just. just Insensitive and just a horrible thing. You were in a tough spot. And I was like, what can you do, right? In an effort to help locate the bodies without Chris having to go to the site again, Agent Coder asks whether a co worker could help. Would you prefer that when you're one of your co workers? Oh my god, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I cannot have that. <laughs> You said that you're about to become a good man. They're going to say this. You're like, what the fuck did you do, Chris? Like, why don't like, you just go to college to begin with? Well, they weren't in your shoes. They don't know. I don't. They weren't living your life. I know, but still, it's like. People are going to be like. Like, you never, like. like <laughs> we'll just go little steps at a time. How about that? I, I can't have anybody show you out there that anybody, no coworkers, please. Okay. I mean, they're, this is, they're just going to form their own opinions anyways once they figure everything out anyway. We'll just take little steps tonight then. How about that? It was the most extreme and passionate Chris had gotten, showing far more concern and emotion than he had shown for anything up until that point, including murdering his wife and the supposed murder of his children. During one of the lulls in the conversation, Ronnie shares with the agents a strange photo that he says Shannon posted on her Facebook page two days ago. He claims that Bella would not have taken such a photo. Agents asked Chris what he thought about it. Do you remember that, Chris? What do you think? Just make fun of it. I thought it was funny. Did Bella do it? I don't know. I don't remember. With Chris breaking down at every mention of returning to the site, the agents leave the father and son and return after about half an hour. They escort Chris's father out to take a restroom break after which he's taken to his own interview room. There, he vouches for his son's character and that he'd never do anything to harm his children. He also repeatedly refers to Shannon as unstable, bipolar, as having mood swings and generally manipulative and antagonistic toward him and his wife. Can you kind of just give us a little bit of a background on their relationship and how long you had known her and uh, the background information together, what 
seven or eight years as far as dating and stuff. Mm -hmm. I got married about five years ago, I think it was, five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, as far as that relationship, it was fine. And then us, being, being my wife, most of my wife's had a hard time getting on with her, but she's, well, I call her uh, narcissist, narcissist, mm -hmm. you know, personality, what she thinks she is, mm -hmm. bipolar, all sides of the you know has these mood swings and stuff and she just said she don't I don't realize how unstable she was. Who said that? That's not good. What did he say that? That was one of these probably about you know, a few days ago, whatever. And yeah, that's the place she is. She just bipolar and zero sixteen. No time. Back in Chris's interrogation room, agents return with a fresh photo of the site where Chris claimed he disposed of the bodies, Survey 319. Earlier that day, while Chris was busy failing his polygraph test, physical and drone searches were being conducted on the site after investigators obtained Chris's work truck's GPS data. It pinpointed his location on the morning of the disappearance. The searches revealed and photograph the missing fitted sheet from the couple's bed, along with freshly moved dirt consistent with a shallow grave. Presented with the photos, they asked Chris to mark the locations where he disposed each of the bodies. So Tim is just telling him, I wanted to show them that picture. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how the rest of the night's going to go. Um, that looks familiar to you. What is that? It's the BRC survey 319. Okay. Where about the Shanann and the girls? How old is this picture? Today. Oh, it's today. Chris marks the drone photo, designating the locations of each of his family members' bodies. S for Shannon, B for Bella, C for Celeste. The reason he was so reluctant to divulge their locations was because he had disposed of his little girl's bodies in two huge tanks of crude oil, an environment where trained engineers in hazmat suits would only be able to survive for a few minutes due to the toxic fumes that they give off. With the locations of the bodies now identified, agents return their attention to Chris in search of more answers. His claim now is that after he told Shannon that he wanted to separate, he went downstairs. Then, after hearing noises upstairs, he went back up and first noticed Bella on the baby monitor, lifeless in her bed. Then, the monitor cycled to Cece's room and Chris saw Shannon strangling her. He says that he ran to where they were, threw Shannon off of Cece, and in a fit of rage, strangled Shannon. The agents never believed his story that so conveniently matched the one they lobbed to him to get his confession rolling. It didn't match the evidence at all. They were all but certain he was the culprit behind all the killings, supported by the fact that he had changed details of his account at least three times between his confession to his dad and the interrogations immediately following. But he would only acknowledge murdering Shannon, not the girls. Is it possible that when we get these girls, you know, uh, Bella, Cece, and Shanann, is it possible when we get them um, that we're going to see um, anything other than the cause of death being her hands? No. Okay. And what I mean by that, and I should be very clear, is that um, it, it's some, some of it's hard to believe that your wife did it, uh -huh. right? You can imagine that. Uh -huh. Okay. So is it possible that maybe she um, did one 
and then you got Shanann, so you did to Shanann what she did to one of your daughters, and then you had to just do it to the other one. Mm-hmm. Tell me. Okay. So is there, that, that's not, no, that's not what happened? No. Okay. Um, is it possible that, is there any other way where we might see your hands on the girl's neck? No. Lord, okay. no. Okay. And you know what I mean? Because when we find their, their little bodies, oh, no. we're going to see the diameter of someone's hand yeah. and someone's fingers, right? So is it at all possible we're going to no. see yours? Okay. No. All right. And I know it's hard, and I know you're probably getting angry at my, my question, but we have to ask. Agents press Watts further regarding his reaction. Can I ask you another tough question? Can you just get it all on the table? When you see Shanann choking, strangling Celeste, and you get her off of Celeste, do you think um, about calling an ambulance? How come? I saw a CG line there, blue and limp. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've never seen something like that in my life. I mean, she just like lay over, like nothing was, she wasn't moving at all, no gas, no breath. So she was totally just blue. So Chris, doing this job for a long time. I know. I, uh, I know a lot of about psychology and as far as like what people are thinking. And most parents will never even want to fathom that their kid, their kid is dead. Even if their kid's stiff, blue in bed, I mean stiff like been dead all night, they still call an ambulance to see if someone can revive their child. And they, when the ambulance get the, gets there and they're like, gosh, their kid's been dead all night, like there's nothing we can do. And the parents are like, what are you, why are you not doing something? What are you talking about? So that's what I'm, that's what we're used to. So I just that's why I want you to explain to me like what was going on in your head and the very and last felt for what she was what she did. It just took over. But do you see that? I, that kind of I understand. Crazy. I, I see where you're coming from. Most parents would still try and call. I see where you're coming from. Yeah. They try to appeal to his sense of decency. I just, I would hate for Shanann to get a bad rap if she didn't have anything to do with it. You know, it's not fair. I know. It's not fair. Like enough bad stuff has happened. I know. Like we need to stop the bad stuff from happening. So, you want to tell us the truth? That is, that is the truth. I will make sure. So you're good with the public knowing that Shanann killed her daughters? I did not hurt these girls. Are you okay with the public knowing that Shanann killed Yes, because I did not hurt these girls. Chris, I'm not sure I believe you. That doesn't work. I don't think you meant to. I, I, I don't think you meant to. I didn't hurt them. You didn't save them either. You know? I know that. I know that. So that doesn't make sense either. None of this makes sense. Nothing like why she would be there. Any, any of this makes sense. Are you sure Shania didn't catch you in? Oh no, my God, no. Watts would not concede, so they hit harder. Chris, you can imagine uh, that we're pretty cynical in our jobs, right? And tonight we've had to talk a lot about a lot of things. And don't get mad, but what it looks like is that you found a new life, and the only way to get that new life was to get rid of your old life. And I think that you killed these girls before their mom came home and then killed them now. And that's what we're kind of left, that's what we have to believe because it just doesn't make sense. I mean, to her point, if I walked in and my kid was decapitated, I'd call an ambulance. 
Mm -hmm. Right? So Knowing there's no hope. It just it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't add up. So either you're this monster who says, yeah. I just want this young hot girlfriend, so I'm gonna kill everyone and hope it works out or something. So I think we're very, very close to the truth, but not like there is. So if you're not that monster. I'm not a monster. I didn't kill my babies. Okay. So tell us what actually happened. I told you what happened. I know, but you know, we're getting later into the day. We've done this a few times and we we talk. Then we show you a little bit of what we're working with, some evidence and facts that we know, and then we, we kind of get our way to the truth. So, so the truth. okay. Everything I've told you. It's truth. So what's going to happen when their cause of death comes back to you? Or the girl's not going to. Okay. You sure? I'm 100% positive it's not going to come back to me. Who's going to come back to you? She never was on top of CC. Okay. Well, what do you want me to say? I just want the truth. That is the truth. And then what about Bella? Bella was laid out sprawled on her bed. Okay. And I saw she on top of Cece, so I ran in there. Okay. Agent Lee asks him whether he felt sorry for what he did. You feel sorry for what you did? Of course, I would, I would have lost the control and got on top of Shania and did that. And then did that. What? Took him out to the well thing? Yes. Unconvincing. Remember his response for later, when Watts talks about remorse. There would be no additional confessions. Chris Watts was arrested. Chris, come stand up for me. I'm going to have you face that wall over there. Yeah, just face it. He was fired by Anadarko that day. Agents were confident that Watts killed his daughters and disappointed that they didn't extract a full confession. But they wouldn't have to wait long. Within two weeks of being arrested, Watts confessed to also killing his daughters. It was part of a plea deal, where prosecutors agreed to not seek the death penalty in exchange for his guilty plea. Based on the mountain of evidence that would be collected after Watts' arrest, a painfully detailed jailhouse confession he would make to agents a few months later, and subsequent letters he'd write to an author, a clearer picture of the events surrounding the murder came into focus. Bend down and hit it, come on. Oh! Nice. Go get Uncle Frankie! Go get Uncle Frankie! Up until August of 2018, Shannon was confident that she was living a picture-perfect life. She had a beautiful family, was a top producer at Lavelle, and was married to the most loving, caring soulmate anyone could ask for. She was scheduled to go on a five-week trip to North Carolina so the girls could spend time with both her and Chris's families. Chris would join them for their last week there, but would stay home for the majority of the trip since he had to work. While the girls did, indeed, get to spend time with family, the trip was not going well. There had already been extreme friction between Shannon and Chris's parents dating back to the start of their relationship. And this visit was no different. The tension grew to an irreconcilable level when Chris's mother serves CC ice cream with peanuts in it. And according to Shannon, his sister laid out an actual bowl of peanuts after Shannon became angry about the peanuts and the ice cream. With Cece being dangerously allergic to peanuts to the point of needing an EpiPen if exposed, Shannon finally lost it. She was furious, left their house as soon as she could, and never went back. She vented to Chris, who promised to handle it when he arrived. Chris's parents were also upset and skipped, going to Cece's birthday party about a week later. And that wasn't the first important event they skipped. And they got married in 2012. Did they get married in North Carolina? They did. Mm -hmm. How was that? Uh, we didn't attend. Really? Mm -mm. 
We didn't attend because Shannon and I just couldn't get along. But the tension with her in-laws wasn't Shannon's only concern. Chris was beginning to behave differently as well. She tried to both text and talk with him about it, even growing angry. But he insisted everything was fine. Once Chris finally joined them in North Carolina, it didn't get any better. He was distant and cold, and everyone noticed. Shannon had booked a trip to the beach for the four of them to get away, and even Bella and Cece, who were normally all over Chris, uncharacteristically shied away from him as a result of him seeming so annoyed with them, which he was actually fine with. They were an obstacle, and he genuinely was annoyed. Also, on his first night there, Shannon said she had a bad headache. So Chris gave her what he told her was an over-the-counter pain reliever, but was actually a potentially lethal and highly addictive narcotic in an effort to end her pregnancy. He thought that if he ended her pregnancy, it would make it easier to leave her and be with Kessinger. She vomited most of the night and he didn't help her, hoping for his desired outcome. On that same night, he texted Kessinger and told her he couldn't talk and could only text for the night. She replied, why not? Are you with her? Kessinger was fine with Chris visiting his family in North Carolina, but not Shannon. So for the remainder of the trip, Chris had as little interaction with Shannon as he possibly could. He avoided any and all intimacy and would simply leave the room whenever it became clear she wanted to be intimate. Shannon shared with her good friend, Addie Maloney, that he hadn't touched or kissed or really even talked to her all week. She notes how they couldn't get enough of each other before the trip. Something was wrong and she knew it. According to a friend, Shannon had speculated about Chris having an affair, but dismissed it, telling the friend that Chris didn't have it in him. Which to many seeing Chris for the first time on television, strapping and fit, may not have seemed to be the case. But the Chris Watts that many saw for the first time on national television barely resembled the man that Shannon met some eight years prior, 60 pounds heavier, as he ironically and chillingly delivered a presentation on infidelity for a speech course he was taking two years into their relationship. Among other things, he discusses what relationship enders are. You have two types of deterioration. You have sudden and you have gradual. Sudden would be an example of infidelity. When somebody is not faithful to their partner, the partners realize that the relationship cannot be sustained. Gradual would be if you met somebody at work or a new friendship has occurred and you, as it goes on, you see that, okay, maybe this relationship has more potential than the relationship I have with my partner. And that would gradually push the old relationship out and push the new relationship in. According to Bloomstein and Schwartz, when a relationship breaks up, it's generally the more attractive one that leaves, which I agree with somewhat and then I disagree with. So, the not-so-fit Chris of their early dating days was a far cry from the more chiseled Chris, whose behavior was now baffling his wife. She assumes that the rift that she had with his parents may be causing his behavior. She texts a friend to give her a visual of what she was facing. He would eventually confirm that he was no longer interested in continuing their marriage. He even bizarrely deleted his Facebook account. And remember that strange photo of the covered-up doll that Chris's father told agents Shannon had posted to her Facebook page? Well, it turns out she was not the person who took the photo. Chris was. He sent it to her three days before the murder, and she replied, Don't know what to think about this. She then posted it to her Facebook page, joking about it. Chris had planted the photo, and his father pushed it. The night before they were set to return to Colorado, Chris told Shannon that he's happy with just Bella and Cece, and doesn't want another baby. Crushed and completely confused, particularly since they decided to have the baby together, she tells him that she doesn't feel safe with him after what he said about the baby. With Shannon devastated, the trip finally comes to an end. They return to Colorado on August 7th, six days before the disappearance. They would be home for a few days before Shannon would have to leave for a business trip to Arizona. She considered canceling given the tension in her marriage, but Chris insisted she go and promised they would talk when she got home. In reality, he saw it as another opportunity to spend more time with Kessinger. But Shannon saw it as a glimmer of hope, especially since Chris agreed to going on a romantic weekend together the following weekend. 
And at some point, since they now knew the gender of the baby Shannon was now 15 weeks pregnant with, they decided to name him Nico. Shannon left for her trip that Friday, hopeful. But it would be short-lived. Just one day into her trip on Saturday night, she noticed a $60 credit card charge Chris just made at a restaurant. It was the first and only slip-up Chris had made exposing his affair to Shannon. Prior to that point, he was able to use gift cards to pay for all their meals. But he'd run out of them on this final dinner date and needed to use their joint credit card. Watts met Nicole Kessinger, also called Nikki, through work at Anadarko. Kessinger worked there as a contractor. The two began communicating via work email and Watts immediately tried taking their relationship to a romantic level, again via email. But Nikki originally rebuffed his flirtations, claiming it was out of respect for herself and directly referring to his wife and kids. But Watts doesn't seem to take the hint. He doesn't back off at all. And eventually, the two begin seriously dating. They wrote, I'm so hooked on you, and penned extensive love notes and letters. Based on the evidence, they were obsessed with each other. I am having a wonderful time. You mean a lot to me. And I'm glad that you're having a blast. I am so out of breath. <laughs> so, while Shannon was sending Chris marital self-help and counseling books, Chris was searching the internet for secluded vacation spots and when to say I love you for the first time in a new relationship. And while Chris was terrible at hiding his changing feelings for Shannon, he was a master at hiding his affair. To cloak his unfaithful activity, Watts had his secret calculator application on his cell phone that to anyone who saw it appeared to be a normal calculator. But when he would enter a secret code into it, it opened access to a concealed storage device where he stored his messages with Kessinger, along with provocative photos and videos of her, some that he himself had taken. Chris acknowledged that he was used to dating women who were more in control and dominating in their relationships. But it wasn't like that with Mickey. She would always ask him what he wanted. It was different, and he liked it. He was living a double life. The moment Shannon and the girls were off to North Carolina, he felt an instant sense of freedom. He spent every possible moment he could with Kessinger, staying at her house most nights his family was away in North Carolina. They even went out in public together on multiple occasions, including going on a short vacation to the sand dunes for the 4th of July. After that trip, Watts stayed the night at Kessinger's house and slept in the next morning. He awoke to find several missed calls from Shannon. He stepped outside to call her. She was furious. He decided to go home for the rest of the day, which made Kessinger angry. So after he went home, Kessinger showed up at his home, claiming she wanted to help him create a protein diet plan. It was the first time she'd been to their home and she didn't get to go too far into it. But she would 10 days later when the couple stopped there briefly after going to the museum. On that visit, the family dog, Dieter, led her upstairs where she got a thorough view of the life that Chris and his family enjoyed. Family pictures and all. Chris had to console her afterward, resulting in both tension, then reconciliation. They returned to her house where they became intimate, but it wasn't the same. In fact, according to Watts, from that point on, their intimate encounters decreased from three to four times per day to one or two. But that was enough to sustain the obsession Watts had with Kessinger, and vice versa. But now it was August. And with Shannon scheduled to return from her Arizona business trip the next day, Chris arranged to steal away with Kessinger to a restaurant called The Lazy Dog, telling the sitter and others that he was at a Rockies game with co-workers. It was at The Lazy Dog that Watts realized he was out of gift cards, and he didn't have enough nerve to ask Kessinger to pay. So, for the first time, he used his and Shannon's joint credit card to pay for their meal. Kessinger noticed him using a credit card and figured that he just didn't care anymore. But Watts would later claim that he just ran out of payment options. Back in Arizona, Shannon was still bothered by the charge. $60 seemed too high for one person's meal. She took to the internet and searched Lazy Dog Menu. It confirmed the cost levels she assumed. Then, an hour after the charge alert came through, Chris was still not home, even though the restaurant was only 15 minutes away. So by this point, in addition to her being clear that Chris had fallen out of love with her, she was also now certain that he was cheating on her. She shared her concern with friends before flying back home to Colorado that Sunday night.
The day before the disappearance, Chris was wrapping up the weekend's events with the girls by taking them to a birthday party. He has them home and tucked in for bed by 7.45 p.m. that evening. Prior to their bedtime, Chris texts a co-worker, telling him that he can go out to the worksite survey 319 in the morning, and that there's no need for his co-worker to go, ensuring he would be the only one there. The co-worker replies saying that he had also planned to go to the site. Watts replied, I can go out there though, no sense in both of us going out there, lol. He spends 111 minutes on a call that night with Kessinger, having phone sex, according to Watts. Despite Chris's original claim that the murders were due to a spur-of-the-moment fit of rage, in reality, to his own acknowledgement, he had been planning to kill his family for weeks. He knew it as he watched them splash around the birthday party the day before. He knew it when he put them to bed just hours before, thinking, that's the last time I'm going to be tucking my babies in. Based on letters Chris Watts wrote to an author from prison, on that morning, prior to killing Shannon, he went to each of his daughter's rooms and used a pillow from their beds to smother them. Then he returned to he and Shannon's bedroom, where they began arguing. Chris told her that he was having an affair, didn't love her, and wanted to separate. According to Chris, Shannon was first hurt, then angry. She said that if he left her, he would never see the kids again. He became angry, and suddenly all the things he resented, now hated, about their relationship came bubbling up. He strangled her as she looked back at him. He thought about stopping, but knew that if he did, it would prevent him from being with Kessinger. He didn't sustain any defensive wounds because, he said, she couldn't fight back. Chris would write at one point that he also gave Shannon a narcotic a second time, just before he killed her, but would later retract that statement. He described how after Shannon had passed, how he was unsuccessful at killing his daughters, as he was wrapping his wife in a sheet Bella and Cece had woken up, came into the room, and asked what was wrong with mommy. He said they were crying, but that he had no desire to comfort them. He struggled to get Shannon's body down the stairs, which distressed the girls even further. It was why he intended to kill them first. He said that he recalled being angry that they were still alive several times, forcing him to have to deal with killing them a second time. Once he dragged Shannon to the truck and got her inside, he told the girls to follow him out to the truck as well. They did, bringing their blankets and stuffed toys along with them. Bella told him that they needed their car seats, and he told them that it was alright this time. Still fuming and shaking, with what Watts claims was years of built-up anger finally released, he drove for just over an hour to survey 319. Once there, he smothers Cece with her blanket. Then, he makes the climb up the staircase to the tank of toxic crude oil to force her body into its 8-inch opening. He recalls how, before he dropped her into the tank, he could not feel anything for her. He was surprised at how easy it was to just let her go. He heard the splash as she hit the oil. He returns to the truck where a terrified Bella asked her father if he's going to do the same thing to her that he did to Cece. She had seen him drop her little sister into the tank. He doesn't recall his answer to her, but that was indeed his intention. As she cried out, Daddy, no, he smothered her with the same blanket. She was the only one who put up a fight. Autopsy results would show that she had a large tear between her lip and gums and bit her tongue multiple times. Then, he forced her into the second crude oil tank. Being bigger than her sister, Watts had to force her through the hatch. She had scratch marks on her buttocks from being shoved, through the unfathomably small hole. He had deliberately put them into separate tanks, both to make sure they didn't get up again, and to make sure they were as far away from Shannon as possible. Then he digs a shallow grave for Shannon and haphazardly tosses her into it before covering her in dirt. Then he said he felt, my entire life lay there on that oil site. All I could feel was now I was free to be with Nikki. Feelings of my love for her was overcoming me, I felt no remorse. I felt like I could kill anything and be justified for doing it. I didn't feel any remorse for what I did. I didn't feel bad for killing my entire family. I really didn't feel anything. My mind went to the dog. Did I remember to put him in the cage? Daddy is a hero. He has
helped me grow up strong. He helped me um not go to. He reads me books. He tied my shoes. If you're a hero, blue and blue, my daddy, daddy, I love you. After the murders, Chris made a series of calls including calling his daughter's school at around 8.30 a.m. to tell them that the girls would not be attending there anymore. Then, he comes to his senses and asks them if they are there. Chris's co-workers arrive at 8.30 a.m. and, according to them, he appeared completely normal, even as his family was just feet away, buried and floating in oil tanks. My name is Nicole, and I'm calling because I'm concerned about um, a friend of mine. Shannon's friends and family are beyond concerned. As they become more and more alarmed, Nicole Atkinson tries to get into the Watts home to check on Shannon, tripping the home's alarm system in the process. Watts tells her to leave his home and stop messing with the doors. They eventually tell Chris they're calling police. He urges them not to and claims he's on his way home multiple times. One friend, Cassandra Rosenberg, texts Chris in no uncertain terms that he needs to haul it home, check on his family. At some point, they're done waiting on his no-shows and clear lack of urgency and call the police. Shannon's family also contacted police and shared their concerns about Chris's involvement. Police arrived within 10 minutes of Nicole's call. Nicole then already opened the front door using the security code she was entrusted with, but could only open it a few inches due to a hotel-style security latch that was locked from the inside. Nicole and the officer spoke with Chris and asked for permission to enter his home. But instead of allowing them to kick the partially open door down past the inner lock to potentially save his family, he said he'd be home in five minutes. Once Chris arrives home, his Shane and his and a friend's story begins to crumble. Alarm bells are going off everywhere for several of her friends who are working together to find their friend. As police, Chris, Nicole, and her son, Search the house for any indication of Shannon's whereabouts. Each life-critical item they uncover sends Nicole as well as Cassandra and Shannon's mom, who were on the phone with Nicole, into a further panic. And same for Chris. But his was a different panic. He had not factored in Nicole calling the police or Shannon's loyal, concerned network of persistent friends. Their efforts, particularly Nicole's, led to the home being searched far earlier than Chris ever planned, preventing him from cleaning up and disposing of the incriminating items once he got home from work. Once they head over to Chris's neighbor's home to view his security footage, instead of Chris scrutinizing every second of what his neighbor captured to try to spot the tiniest of clues about the whereabouts of his missing family, Chris shows exactly zero interest in the video. Chris recalls that he was shocked as they watched the video footage because he thought they could see the girls walking up to the truck and him putting them in. The evening passes with no news about the whereabouts of his family. Chris does get a follow-up call from an officer, and he tells the officer that while he has not cheated, it's possible that Shannon may have. At approximately 4.30 a.m., Shannon's mother, Sandra Ruzek, contacted the Frederick Police Department to report that she and her husband believed that her daughter and granddaughter's disappearance involved foul play and that Chris was involved. She said she felt that he was pouring oil on the bodies to dispose of them somewhere. Both her parents and Shannon's friend, Cassandra, felt that if police would track Chris's GPS from that morning, they would find their family. Already highly suspicious of Watts, Police stationed an unmarked patrol car near his home 24-7, monitoring his every move, as well as lauding any activity to or from the home. On that morning following the disappearance, CBI agent Tammy Lee and FBI agent Graham Coder are called in to Frederick. It's also the day that police interview Shannon's friend, Nicole Atkinson. She recalls the details of the previous day, repeatedly noting that each discovery led her to have bad thoughts about what had happened to Shannon, all pointing to Chris. Chris backing up his work truck to their garage at 5.18 in the morning and loading something up in it. And that's when my mind went bad, like really bad, because what would he be loading up at 5.18 in the morning? And Shanann yells at him and he doesn't go out the garage because the garage is right below the, the girl's bedroom and it would wake them up. Toward the end of the interview, she shared a speculation. 
Like, if it was a crime of passion, I honestly think to God you'd strangle her. Only because she already has the neck issue. I mean, yeah. I don't know. What was that from? She had a, I don't know if it was a, I don't know if it started out as a slip disc or, but it was a degenerative <clears throat> disc. And they went in and fused some stuff in her neck. She's got a scar on the front part of her neck. Okay. Watts agrees to two television interviews that day, the timing of which allows the freshly arrived agents to gather and watch what's now referred to as the Sermon on the Porch, right as it was being aired. Bella was going to start kindergarten. After watching it, Agent Lee turned to Agent Coder and said, Oh, sh she commented that they needed to get Watts in for questioning immediately to get his story down and recorded. They call him in. Before Chris heads to the police station for the interview, he sends out a group email confirming that he will participate in fantasy football. Early on in the interrogation, as Watts was claiming his innocence, Agent Coder stepped out of the room. He shared that with the frequency with which Watts kept unconsciously touching and making movements toward his neck area, he suspected that he may have strangled Shannon. Agents will not start getting to the truth until the next day. Many of the tactics Agent Lee deployed before and during Watts' polygraph test were to get into his head. Right now, there's only one person in this room that knows what the truth is. And in about five minutes, there's going to be two of us. So that's the coolest part. So you obviously are a really bad liar. Have, have people told you that before? Like the second you tell a lie, like they can tell like on your face that... For polygraph tests, someone is considered deceptive if they score a negative four or below. Chris Watts scored a negative 18. With that abysmally low score, agents knew that Watts had done something to his family. They just needed to figure out how to get him to confess. They directly confront Chris that he is lying, and while throwing scenarios at him, Agent Lee eventually offers up the Shannon did something to the kids scenario. The moment she said that, she said that they could see the change in Chris's eyes. So they stuck with it. Chris himself would later acknowledge that he had not thought of blaming Shannon before that. But as a parent, the feasibility of that scenario was highly flawed. In reality, when faced with such a scenario, most people would call the police and try to revive their children, not kill their spouse, then hide all their bodies. Watts would later report that the hard part of the interrogation for him was that he did not feel any remorse, but he had to pretend like he did. Watts' arrest process began about 10 p.m., and they would recover Shannon's body an hour later. The recovery crew noted that she was curled up, as if just thrown in. The painstaking process of retrieving the young girls would begin the following morning. Crews began arriving at about 5 a.m. The CBI agent in charge noted that investigators arrived with a sense of dread, knowing what their mission was going to be. The entire recovery process would take nearly 14 hours of methodical planning and careful execution in an extremely dangerous environment. The operation involved up to multiple representatives from each of 10 agencies and companies. An Anadarko employee briefed everyone about the process. He informed them that the east tank contained about 9 feet of crude oil and the west tank just under one and a half. They'd start with the east tank. Investigators opened the hatchet of one of the tanks they revealed openings so small, just 8 inches or 20 centimeters in diameter, that they doubted whether the girls could even fit through them. But then they found blonde hair attached to one of the openings, confirming that it was, indeed, the route that the girls had traveled. So the recovery process began. The two 400-barrel tanks had to first be manually drained into holding tanks, with the extracted oil run through metal screens to filter any possible evidence. Once each tank was emptied, the welding crew began removing the bolts from the door that was located at the base of each tank. They were then allowed to step to the side, while a trooper and CBI agent wearing fully protective hazardous material gear finished removing the door, then entered the pitch black tank. They could only remain in the tank for a few minutes at a time because of the toxic fumes, and had to undergo an extensive decontamination process afterward. In the east tank, they located the body of Cece still in her nightgown and a diaper, and covered in crude oil. Having been in the tank for three days at that point, her body was badly decomposed, making it problematic to handle and transport her out of the tank. Once Cece was removed, they performed the same process to retrieve Bella, still 
in her pink pajama top. She was larger than Cece, resulting in a 5-inch or 13-centimeter scratch on her bottom from being forced through the tiny opening. On the same day the bodies were being retrieved, investigators were conducting their second of five interviews with Watts' mistress Nicole Kessinger, accompanied by her dad. Kessinger showed up to the interview tired, aloof, and generally uncooperative. She revealed how super cute she thought it was that Chris had kids. And then one day he told me that he had two kids. I was like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, started telling me about his kids. That sounded like a sarcastic comment. No, I thought it was kind of cute. I was like, oh, he's a dad. It was like right around Father's Day, too. Everything was generally hunky-dory until they asked her to hand over her phone. I really want to help you guys. I do. Totally. I feel like I'm, I'm, this whole thing is just going to be crazy regardless of whether I give you my phone or not. Prior to showing up for the interview, Kessinger had actually deleted every one of her and Watts's text messages, calls, photos, and videos, and even its contact. And she told Watts to do the same. Much of that data was never able to be recovered by law enforcement. And there were numerous other questionable actions regarding the mistress. But We'll start with that destruction of evidence we just mentioned. She claimed that she deleted it all because she was grossed out. What did that cause you to do with your phone, though? Oh, what, when I deleted those? I was just kind of grossed out by him, to be honest with you. I was just like, I don't know what's going on right now, but you just lied to me, and I don't want to see this come over my phone anymore. So I removed it. So you re just, you already said, but you removed text messages? I deleted all of his stuff because he lied to me. I mean, that's what it was. It was it was the hurt that made me delete it. And then it was the lie that made me start questioning everything else he'd been telling me for the last few days. And that's when you decided to come forward? Yes. Okay. The information was not destroyed because there was anything in there that would be uh, harmful to you or potentially to Chris at this point, but harmful to you in particular. That's not why you did it. No, 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 You no, did no, it no. out of... Uh, excuse my language, this guy's an asshole, so I'm getting it rid of him, and I'm getting this stuff off my phone. That was like me kicking him out of my life. Okay. And then, like I said, and then realizing that he lied, that was when I was like, okay, maybe his family is in danger, and they're not coming back, and they're not staying with a friend. Kessinger also lied to investigators. A lot. And not just immaterial or subjective lies, but relevant, provable lies. Like her claim that she didn't know that Watts was married at first, even though their email messages that predate their affair clearly prove otherwise. He didn't have a wedding ring on his finger, and every time I talked to him, he didn't tell me that he was in a relationship. And that she only visited the Watts home once when she had actually been there twice. She also told law enforcement that she wasn't really that into Watts. Yet, just nine days prior to the murders, she spent two hours searching the internet for terms like wedding dresses, and marrying your mistress. She also lied about knowing Shannon's name. Did he mention the children's name or his significant other's name? Um, I didn't know his significant other's name for a while. That claim didn't add up given that she had ran hours of internet searches for Shannon Watts, dating as far back as at least January of 2018, and possibly as early as September of 2017 if the official records are accurate. Either way, she searched Shannon's name months before she met Chris Watts at work and began exchanging emails, and even months before she began even working at Anadarko. Her verified internet searches of both Chris and Shannon's names would easily have revealed both of their Facebook accounts, showing that they were married with kids and what Chris's interests were, interests that Kessinger would later happen to share in common with Chris, like car museums, drag racing, and more. Then, there was her internet search history. In addition to her earlier repeated searches for Shannon's name, on the day following the disappearance, Kessinger also searched, can cops trace text messages? How long do phone companies keep text messages and more? She deleted her search history afterward. Then, while not indicative of any guilt, six days after the murder, she ran several searches for Amber Fry, the woman who was having an affair with Scott Peterson, when he murdered his wife, Lacey, and their unborn child in 2002. She searched Amber Fry's book deal, Amber Fry net worth, and deep people hate Amber Fry. Also, 
At 6 a.m. on the morning of the murders, when Watts would have been on his way to the site to bury his wife and kids, Kessinger's phone suspiciously pinged in Frederick, the same town as the Watts' home, which is more than 20 minutes away from Kessinger's home. There was also Kessinger's conveniently poor recollection, while Kessinger could recall her conversation with Chris when he informed her that his wife was pregnant but that it was not his. He said, uh, she told me that she's pregnant, and she told me that the kid is not mine. Like, I legitimately thought this woman left the premises with her kids and just wanted nothing to do with him for like 24 hours. However, when police ask her about what she and Watts talked about during their 111-minute phone call the night Shannon returned home from her trip, just hours before his family was murdered, she hasn't a clue. I still don't remember what we talked about. I like, honestly, like we talked about so much random stuff. Like it's so hard to pinpoint some of these things. Watts would later reveal that the call was phone sex. And that poor recollection of the 111 minute call may be a perfect example of how some of Kessinger's forgetfulness and lies could potentially just be her trying to save face from the embarrassment of the affair, completely unrelated to the murders. But what baffles and concerns followers of the case is that she doesn't appear to have been investigated or even challenged. So as of the making of this video, there continues to be public speculation about her involvement. During a press conference following Watts' sentencing hearing, Weld County District Attorney Mike Work stated law enforcement's position on Kessinger. She originally came forward and, and spoke to investigators on her own volition. Prior to the time, unfortunately, that she came in and spoke with investigators, she had deleted all of the information off of her phone that had any connection between her and Chris Watts. That hampered the investigation. Um, that hampered our ability to get that electronic digital um, connection between the two. She was interviewed on multiple occasions. I believe that for the most part, she was forthcoming in the course of those investigations. Uh, we don't have any reason to believe that she had any prior knowledge or involvement in the death of Shanann, Bella, Celeste, and Nico. Um, I think that's the best way I can answer that. Speaking of people not being of concern to law enforcement, there were also other claims of Chris being unfaithful. With the intense media coverage the case received, people came out of the woodworks, including both a woman who claimed to have had an affair with Watts, as well as a man who claimed to be Watts's former lover. But police don't buy it. Some of the stuff you're talking about is pretty hard to believe. And we're getting to the point where we're wondering if you're wasting our time. Uh -huh. I mean, is there a question or, I mean, I don't know how you want me to respond to that. I don't know what else you want me to. These are the challenges that we have, right? You told us that you watched the video over and over. Okay, so we know that you're aware of everything that's out there. And all you've talked about are things that anyone else knows. You haven't brought forth any information. You're having sex with a guy in his car and you don't know anything about him other than what the public knows about him. Okay, you took $60 from him. You, you're a self-admitted booty call. And so now we're wondering if you're a hooker who maybe guy who was a murderer and maybe feels guilty about it or maybe feels like you're going to get in trouble about it. I don't know what's going on with you, but I don't know why you're here tonight. No, I'm not a hooker. Neither the woman nor the man's claims were proven, and both were considered not credible by authorities, likely on quests for their 15 minutes of fame. The funeral for the family took place in North Carolina. But with Bella and Cece's bodies having been immersed in crude oil so long they were highly flammable, that meant they couldn't be cremated. And they also had to be sealed in a special wrap during transport so that gases wouldn't leak out. Their resulting larger-than-normal sealed coffins prevented their beloved family from being able to see them and say their final goodbyes. The tension that brewed between Chris's parents and Shannon since the beginning of their relationship was not eased by her murder. The statements Ronnie Watts made about Shannon being unstable during his interview with law enforcement were echoed again when he and his wife took to the airwaves. They began by defending their son. And I just want him to fight. I want this plea. I want him to not take this plea deal. I want him to, to plead not guilty to the children. If he's saying you didn't kill the kids, why, why do this plea deal? I have no idea. The only reason I can think of he's trying to 
for our family and her family yeah. not to have to go through a trial, long drawn out trial. It has been so overwhelming and I feel like I have to do something to to help my son to to I just I need to do something. If he's not gonna fight, I want to fight for him. He's not a sociopath. <laughs> he's not a psychopath. But they took the opportunity to also disparage Shannon. I don't think he just had the right person at his side. I don't. That relationship was toxic from the very beginning. What happened to that kid from Pine Forest High School? He met Shanann. That's what happened to him because that boy, he knew what he wanted to do. He went to NASCAR Technical Institute. It has been a nightmare, a complete nightmare. Are you guys worried about some of the backlash about maybe coming out and speaking on behalf of Chris and what it might what it might do to your guys' relationship and you know speaking out like this to about a woman who can't defend herself right mm -hmm. now. Well Shanann, I mean she was you have to get to know her to be around her. Put it that way. Shannon's family, the ones who actually had a right to be angry and to lash out responded to her killer's parents in the most admirable, dignified manner imaginable. They issued a statement that called the Watts' remarks about Shannon, vicious, grotesque, and utterly false, noting that Shannon was a faithful wife and the most gentle and loving mother in the world to her children. They added that their false statements, however hurtful and inaccurate, will never alter the truth about Shannon. Her memory and reputation deserves to be protected, and her family is fully prepared to do so. On August 21st, Chris Watts was charged with five counts of first-degree murder, two which were special counts for children being under 12 years old, unlawful termination of a pregnancy, and three counts of tampering with a deceased human body. With Watts pleading guilty, there would be no trial. Prior to his sentencing hearing, the Ruzek family felt strongly that as horrifically as Watts had taken Shannon and the girls' lives, his life was not theirs to take. Honoring Shannon's family's wishes, the district attorney's office accepted an offer from Watts' defense, where Chris would plead guilty to all charges, in exchange for the DA not seeking the death penalty. The Watts family was given the opportunity to make a statement prior to Watts' sentencing. Their attorney first spoke on their behalf to retract what they had projected in the past. The prosecution in this case has in fact respected the Victim Bill of Rights. They took the time to explain that the information that my clients had at the time that they were interviewed was not correct. They were misinformed, they were searching for answers, they were not intending to cause any pain to anyone, and they appreciate that the prosecution answered their questions and gave them the time and the respect and the consideration so that they could tell this court and everyone in this community that the interview content was not their message, that they accept that their son has done this, that they accept that he chose to plead guilty, that he sought and requested their consent and agreement for a life sentence. My clients indicate that they understand that a full opportunity for a confession with all of the responsibility and accountability has not occurred. And they support the family and the request that that happen, if not today, at an appropriate time, in an appropriate manner, so that everyone can have peace to understand, to the best of their ability, the details that they need and to have their questions answered. And by giving this opportunity of a life sentence, we hope that he embraces that moment, that had the death penalty been pursued, there would not have been an opportunity to be accountable and to give a full confession. And then Chris's parents spoke directly. We will always mourn the loss of our family. And in that, we are united in our grief I am still struggling to understand how and why this tragedy occurred. I may never be able to understand and accept it, but I pray for peace and healing for all of us. Now to my son Christopher, I have known you since the day you were born into this world. I have watched you grow from a quiet and sweet, curious child who Bella reminded me so much of to a young man who worked hard in sports and later mechanics to achieve your goals. 
You are a good friend, brother, father, and son. You have, we have loved you from the beginning, and we still love you now. This might be hard for some to understand how I can sit here under these circumstances and tell you, although we are heartbroken, although we can't imagine what could have led us to this day, but we love you. Maybe you can't believe it either. As the Lord said in Jeremiah 3.31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. And you, as your mother, Chris, I have always loved you, and I still do. I hate what has happened. Your father and sister and I are struggling to understand why. But we will remain faithful as your family, just as God remains faithful because of his unconditional love for all, for us all. We love you. And we forgive you, son. And of course, the Ruzek family shared their statements as well. Who dare you take the lives of my daughter, Shannon, Bella, Celeste, and Nico? I trusted you to take care of them, not kill them. And they also trusted you. You monster. Thought you would get away with this. I don't know how. The cameras do not lie. You carry them out like trash of the house. Yes. I seen the videotape. You buried my, my daughter Shannon and, and Nico in a shallow grave. And then you put Bella and Celeste in huge containers of crude oil. You heartless monster. You have, you have to live with this vision every day of your life. And I hope you see that every time you close your eyes at night. Oh, I forgot. You have no heart or feelings or love. Let me tell you something. I will think of them every day of my life. And I love them every day of my life. Prison is too good for you. This, this is hard to say, but may God have mercy on your soul. I hope you enjoy your new life. It's nothing like the one you had out here. Love you, Shannon, Bella, and Nico. Love you, Pop Up and Dad. And one other thing, and Shannon says she is super excited for justice today. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Shannon's younger brother's statement was read by District Attorney Rourke. He has asked me to read his statement for him, but he would like to stand with me if that's okay. Of course. You went from being my brother, my sister's protector, one of the most loved people in my family, to someone I will spend the rest of my life trying to understand. What gave you the right to put your hands on a woman, let alone my best friend, my beloved sister, your daughters, and your son? Why weren't they enough for you? In the blink of an eye, you took away my whole world, the people that mattered to me the most. Everything in my life I loved, your children. They trusted you. They loved you. They looked up to you because you promised to keep them safe. Instead, you turned on your family. My blood is boiling as I write these last words because they are the last you will ever hear from me. I can't even think of the right words to describe the betrayal and the hate I feel. And to be honest, you aren't even worth the time and effort it takes to put my pen to this paper. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't cry for my family. They were my whole world. All I do is ask myself why. Why would you do this? You don't deserve to be called a man. What kind of person slaughters the people that love them the most? Did you really think you would get away with this? Did you really think that this was your best option, to throw away your family like they were garbage? They deserve better and you know it. I hope you spend the rest of your life staring at the ceiling every night, being haunted by what you've done. Shanann, Bella, and Cece loved you more than anyone. You were their hero. How could you destroy the people who loved them the most? I pray that you never have a moment's peace or a good night's rest in the cage you'll spend every day of your life in. A cage you are privileged to live in because my family isn't evil like you. My life will never be the same because of you, but at least my conscience is clear. I get to live free, but I can't say the same for you. I haven't slept in two days because I've been anxiously waiting for this moment, the moment I get to tell you how I feel, how this has affected my family and I. My family and I can finally grieve after today. 
If anything, we will come out of this stronger today than we were before, and we will continue to pray for your family. Sincerely, Frankie Rusick. My name is Sandra Rusick, Shannon's mother. I wanted to say thank you for this moment. I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has prayed for our beloved family, who had sent gifts, cards to us from all over the world. I know God will put the evil people where they need to be. I also want to take the time to thank the town of Frederick, um, Greeley, uh, FBI, the DA's office, the CBI, for exceptional work. We thank Nicole um, Atkinson, um, Shannon's neighbor, Nathan, and his family. Um, to me, they're our heroes. They really, they really are. God bless. Um, God makes no mistakes on who he puts in your life. Marriage is about love, trust, and friendship and unity. Our daughter Shannon loved you with all of her heart. Your children loved you to the moon and back. Shannon's family was her world. Shannon put a crown on your head. But unfortunately, the day that you took their life, God removed that crown. We loved you like a son. We trusted you. Your faithful wife trusted you. Your children adored you, and they also trusted you. Your daughter, Bella Marie, sang a song proudly. And I don't know if you got to see it, but it was, Daddy, you're my hero. I have no idea who gave you the right to take their lives. But I know God and his mighty angels were there at that moment to bring them home to paradise. God gives us free will. So not only did you take the family of four, your family of four, you took your own life. I want the world to know that our daughter and her children were so loved by us. They will always be protected by God and his mighty angels. I didn't want death for you because that's not my right. Your life is between you and God now, and I pray that he has mercy for you. From Shannon's mother, Bella Marie, Celeste Catherine, and Nico Lee's Nana. Thank you, Your Honor. And after both families' heart-wrenching, soul-revealing statements brought on by Watts' actions, Chris Watts himself had a statement to be presented as well. Good morning, Your Honor. Mr. Watts has asked us to share this morning that he is devastated by all of this. And although he understands that words are hollow at this point, he is sincerely sorry for all of this. Thank you. Prior to handing down the sentence, the judge had a statement as well. The evidence in this case are a senseless crime and the viciousness of the crime. And equally aggravating in this court's determination is the despicable act of disposing of the bodies in the manner in which they were done in this case. I've been a judicial officer now for starting my 17th year, and I um, could objectively say that this is perhaps the most uh, inhumane and vicious crime that I have handled out of the thousands of cases that I have seen. And nothing less than a maximum sentence um, would be appropriate, and anything less than the maximum sentence would depreciate the seriousness of this offense. So the court is going to sentence Mr. Watts as follows. Watts would be sentenced to five consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, two concurrent life sentences, plus 84 years. In 2020, the death penalty was abolished in Colorado. So if Watts had been sentenced to death, his sentence would have been commuted to life. 
like it was for the three inmates who were on Colorado's death row at the time. Nicole Kessinger was fired from Anadarko following the murders. Not much is known about her whereabouts or life after the murders, other than the fact that she moved out of her home in Colorado, and that she applied for a name change in 2020. Whether or not she moved out of the state is not known. On the day Chris Watts pleaded guilty, the Ruzek family filed a wrongful death suit against him to ensure that he didn't profit from the death of their family members in case he ever decided to write a book or sell the rights to his story. While the suit was largely symbolic and they don't expect to see much, if any, payment, they won the case. And Watts was ordered to pay the family $6 million. Chris Watts was originally sent to a prison in Colorado to serve out his sentence. There, he was kept in protective isolation for his own security because his fellow inmates knew who he was, what he had done, and had special plans for him. According to Watts, his presence in the prison was so triggering that they had to lock down the jail just for him to walk down the hallways. He was threatened, yelled at by the other inmates, and told the dangerous things he could do to himself nearly constantly. He was certain that had they gotten to him, it would most certainly have killed him. He is an outcast, even among criminals. So, out of security concerns, Watts was moved to Dodge Correctional Institution, which is a maximum security prison in Wapun, Wisconsin. There, he is able to be in the general population and doesn't endure as much harassment. He is said to be a model prisoner who doesn't ask for anything and doesn't complain. In prison, Watts says he has immersed himself in the scripture, has found God, and is hoping people will forgive him. He spends most of his day in his cell, but is allowed recreational time as well as 40 minutes of outdoor activities like basketball when the weather is good. He says he keeps photos of his wife and children in his cell, and that he reads one of the girl's favorite books to their pictures each night. A petition was circulated to have the photos removed, since they are pictures of his victims. But prison officials responded that the photos did not violate prison policy. A portion of the earnings that Watts makes working as a custodian at Dodge goes toward paying off the restitution that he was ordered to pay. Watts says that he has not spoken with Nikki since being incarcerated, but that his attorneys tried to unsuccessfully reach out to her several times on his behalf. He said that he hopes she was able to find peace and move on with her life, and that he is sorry she lost her job and had to move. In prison, Watts garnered a fan base. Very early on, he began receiving a massive volume of letters from women who found him handsome. Regarding the heinous crime he committed, they felt he was misunderstood and offered their compassion, along with sexy photos. He wrote many of them back and established some pen pals, and some of them even turned into visitors. On February 18, 2019, about three months after Watts was sentenced, Agents Lee, Coder, and Lead Detective Baumover met with Chris Watts in prison. He spoke with them for five hours, providing new details about the background, timeline, and details of the murders. Hey, Chris. Chris? Do you remember us? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, okay. I see. I'll just sit here for a moment there. Good to see you. Good How are you doing? I'm okay. How about you guys? Good. Okay. Yeah. I, did, I did not expect to see this, that's for sure. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. well, well, let me put some fears aside. Um, we're not here for what you might think we might be here for. So you remember, um, I talked to you, Tammy talked to you, Dave talked to you. We're all from Colorado. Um, and so the last time we talked to you was a different situation, right? Um, our investigation was open and your case was open. Um, that's completely different now. So your case is completely closed. Nothing about what we're going to talk about today is, has anything to do with an open investigation. So we're not here to get more charges on you or get any statements from you that are going to jam you up anymore. Um, but why we are here, and as the months have passed on since everything happened, we just keep in touch with each other and we keep talking to each other. And we've all separately kind of said, did Chris's situation seem different to you? We think that your life leading up to all of the things that happened uh, were very interesting to us. I've never, ever worked a case like this where someone would have ever. In talking with Tammy and talking with Dave, um, I said, you know, what did you feel like when it all went down? When we were there, we were talking to you guys, and we all kind of, in our own different way and in our own different wording, said it all happened a bit too quick for us, right? Um, so we saw you last, you we were talking and talking and talking, and then the next thing you know, me and Tammy and for Dave, all of a sudden some patrol officers came in and arrested you. Um, and that was far quicker than we had hoped it would happen. Um, and you understand why that happened, and we understand why that happened. 
but it left us with a thousand questions that we didn't get to ask. Um, and then even more importantly, I think it probably left you with a thousand things that you didn't get to talk about with us. I don't know if you feel that way or not, but, um, and so that's why we're here today. Um, we wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit more about everything. He voluntarily shared how he went about murdering his family to the agents, the details of which we've reflected in this video. In true Chris Watts fashion, some of the details he shared with agents don't add up, reminding us that each of his versions of what happened that morning is worthy of the scrutiny and mistrust of it coming from a lying, cheating, murderous narcissist. She like kind of rolled over and I was just like, just like right there on top of her. Okay. And then you're talking while you're on top of her? Mm -hmm. Okay. That seems confusing to me. Agents ask Watts directly whether Kessinger was involved in any way. There are quite a few people who would tell us and who do tell us you need to look into Nikki more, Nikki Kessinger. All the way from the extreme end of things being Nikki's the one who ordered the hit. She was there, hiding in the basement. She was there. Yeah. You know, so the, the extreme is she's the one who told Chris to do it. She's the real problem. All the way, that's the extreme side, and then all the way to, well, there were these texts where she was infatuated, she was in love, she was saying how good Chris was in the sack, and maybe we should look at her more. And so, are those people absolutely wrong about Nikki? She wasn't asking you to get rid of your family. Are you sure? Okay. And no part of any of this was because she put it in your head or asked you to, or you never made. But even the mountain of details he disclosed during that lengthy addendum to his confession would not be his final disclosure. If the details exposed during the prison visit were eye-opening, what Watts later revealed for a book written by one of his early pen pals was staggering. Watts began corresponding via letter, phone calls, and then in-person visits with an author named Sherilyn Cadle. Cadle would turn that correspondence into a book she published in 2019 titled Letters from Christopher. The Tragic Confessions of the Watts Family Murders Although Watts is an unreliable source of an ever-evolving story, like his confession to the agents at Dodge, these subsequent admissions only serve to shed an even worse light on himself. The letters are how the public learned that he tried to kill his daughters before killing Shannon, leading to him having to kill them twice. It's where he finally divulged that he had been planning to kill his family for weeks, and it's where he painted a picture of what true evil looks like. The Watts home on Saratoga Trail in Frederick, where Chris Watts committed the murders, was placed on auction in May of 2019 after Watts defaulted on his mortgage leading the bank to foreclose. But with multiple liens against the home which any buyer would be liable for, including one for the $6 million Chris owed the Ruzex, as well as overdue HOA fees, there were no interested buyers. It remained vacant until May 2022 when the home was secretly put on the market under a fictitious address. To prevent looky-loos, potential buyers were required to submit bank commitment letters before viewing the home. The home sold for $600,000. Buyers of the home may face challenges, as a neighbor reports that the home continues to attract a lot of attention with multiple cars driving by every hour on the weekends, some stopping to take photos, and some even breaking in, requiring the police to be called. This case was brutally heart-wrenching, taking a toll on everyone even remotely affiliated with it. Shortly after hearing Watts's full confession at Dodge, lead detective Dave Baumover, who originally joined the Frederick Police Department in search of a more low-key position in a smaller community, was diagnosed with PTSD. The sight of a small girl at a restaurant would trigger him to have to leave the restaurant. He tried to go back to work, but his flashbacks got worse. He stopped sleeping, began to have memory gaps, and had trouble controlling his emotions. His wife, Lori, says that it's hard to leave the house, stating, where do you go where you don't see little girls? She said that it's dangerous to watch television or to go online. If they go out, she directs her husband where he shouldn't look so he can avoid seeing kids that might trigger him. Don't look down that aisle, there's a family, she'll say. Don't look right, look up. She said, I feel like if I don't catch a little girl, like if I miss one, that I failed him. Detective Baumover said, it's easier to just not go anywhere. After a career of difficult cases culminating with the Watts case, he underwent counseling and time off, but ultimately, he decided it was time to resign. Two days after witnessing the recovery of the bodies, Agent Tammy Lee broke down sobbing at a hair salon while her mother and sister helplessly looked on. 
She sought counseling but admits that the memory of seeing Bella removed from the tanks still haunts her. She said that she can't get that image out of my head. It was that vision of the girls being recovered from the oil tanks that became etched in several of the recovery workers' memories forever. Many wisely underwent therapy afterward. And of course, the families. Both the Ruzek and Watts families suffered tremendous losses brought on by Watts's senseless killings. Aside from the sheer grief of losing their beloved family members, the Ruzek family in particular have had to face slander, harassment, threats on their lives, social media accounts created impersonating the family, and Shannon's and the Ruzek family's character dragged through the mud. The harassment became so extreme, the family was forced to hire an attorney, and they have fought to have cyberbullying laws changed. We hope this video did justice to Shannon, Bella, Celeste, and Nico. We hope it also paid proper respect to the mourning Ruzek family who had every right to be front and center, to complain, to blame, and they could not. They only surfaced to speak truth and protect their daughter and granddaughter's honor in a sincere and dignified manner, just as Shannon appeared to carry it herself. They are the definition of dignity. We also hope this video paid proper respect to Shannon's group of true friends who wouldn't rest until their friend and her babies were found. One of the controversies swirling around this case is that it's not fair to paint Shannon as being flawless, with people claiming things like, she posted too much, or embellished, or was controlling, or worse, and that all the blame was unfairly placed on Watts. Well, she was not flawless, none of us are, but none of us deserve to be murdered. The notoriety this case has brought Chris Watts himself is unsettling. From the unending attention he receives from scores of women worldwide, to the simply staggering following this case has amassed, they disturbingly afford him practically celebrity status. Is this narcissist, who previously lived in relative obscurity and never had a serious relationship prior to Shannon living his best life, while his loving, trusting family had all their days taken away from them? What do you think? We can't wait to hear your thoughts about this emotionally charged case. Please share them in the comments below. We'll be hopping into those comments along with you as long as we can. And as usual, if you like how we presented this case, we'd really appreciate you hitting like and share and of course, subscribe so you never miss a single video.